Hi guys, welcome to another Wearing Electronics Repair video. This came in there this morning and um, <laughs> I've just been told it's very urgent. So can I repair it and it's very urgent, can I fix it for tomorrow? So me being me, I said, well, let's have a look, yeah. <laughs> let's have a look. I mean, it's all electronics at the end of the day, yeah. So this is yet another piece of industrial or commercial electronics. And let's see if our electronic skills can get this thing working, yeah. I mean, I don't know anything much about it, but fortunately, I do know what it comes from. And that might help us, yeah. So I'll show you the information i have the pictures the guy sent me and then hopefully that at least will give us some idea what this thing's supposed to do so these are the images that i have from the guy this is what it comes from it says dieselmatic uh e03 functional emiento signals that means alarms i think you can figure that out yourself from spanish yeah so shows a switch now this here is clearly a switch and i think i can think i can see that on the circuit board in fact i'm sure i can i'll show you in a minute i can see where the stop switch is so our pcb sits behind here we have some leds for hertz volts this is a generator yeah this is a generator but it seems to have a battery backup as well so it could be an inverter i mean I'll look this thing up, dieselmatic, yeah, let's see if it tells us, but I'm guessing it's probably a generator, it looks like a picture of a generator there to me, yeah, I have a few more pictures, let's have a look, so he sent me, yeah, this is the actual PCB we can see, what else do we have? This is again is it on the unit. We can see a wire attached to it. Uh, what's this saying? 350 hertz, 380 volts. Uh, okay, that's what it seems to say. Oh, okay, so there's more of it. So there's a lot of switch gear here. This is our PCB. This looks like a transformer, so I'm guessing that this thing is connecting. Is that, is that our PCB? Do you know, I'm not sure that is our PCB at all. No, it doesn't look like our PCB, so that's not our PCB. Okay, what else do we have? External connections. Okay. Now it says 220 volt on this. More connections. And there is the machine. So this what is what it comes from. This, if you ask me, is a generator. Yeah, it's off a generator. So that's the Jenny, as I guess they call them. Ah, this is our PCB, so it shows us some wires attached to it. Yeah, top of our PCB again. More. Unfortunately, I don't know where these wires go, so it doesn't help me a lot. Yeah, it doesn't help me a lot. I'm assuming this is supposed to be. Um, so I have a red, blue, red, blue. Red grouper, whatever that, I'm not sure what that is, it's not a colour. Um, use. Voltage connections to, that you have to make to use, basically. Um, uh, more connections. And that's it. So that's what we have. So, at least we know a little bit about it. It's obvious there's a problem here. So, let's zoom down and let's have a look around this PCB. This, I'm sure, is a speaker or a buzzer. This is the switch. This is definitely a switch. It looks like a switch. It has lots of legs on it. Uh, we can see it here. Looks like it's 
two poles in the middle, and I'm guessing there's 12 connections. One, two, three, four, yeah, it looks like it's 12. So that's a two pole, six way switch. We can see that much. This is a BDX34C. I'm sure that is a transistor. What's that on it? Is that like a mark or a... It's not recessed in any way. It's not like a, a crack in it, I don't think. It's just like a, a mark. Let me just stop those nasty blue lines on the camera. I don't know what causes those. I get them occasionally. I just deactivate the camera and reactivate it and they go away. So we have uh, some chips here. LM339. This is a quad comparator. Basically four op amps, but wired in such a way or designed in such a way that it will have each comparator will have two inputs and one output. And it compares the voltage between the two inputs and it switches the output accordingly, whether one is higher than the other. Uh, this one, obviously, they don't want us to know what it is. Uh, same with this one. How many pins has this got? Twenty-eight pins. I mean, that's like an EEPROM, but I don't think it is an EEPROM because I don't see a processor on here. I don't think we're going to get any markings from that one. The same as this one here as well. We can try a bit of ISO, but I don't think we will. Okay, let's just try it. Yeah, uh, I think that's been pretty well obliterated. To be quite honest, I don't think we're going to get any from that no no traces probably same with this one uh, nothing and I'm pretty sure we're going to have to get this is the same uh, uh, is there a bit of something on that one can we read it try a little bit of light across it just shine a torch over it No, I don't think so. Uh, another LM339 quad comparator. And there's a couple of chips that I don't know, uh, but we can soon find out what they are, see if it helps us. So we have this MCT1413P, another one there. And this LM2907. Let's have a look to see what those chips are. Frequency to voltage converter. So this is no doubt measuring the frequency, the 50 hertz. And it gives an output voltage proportional to the frequency. Okay, so we can gather that is to monitor the frequency of the generator. I'm pretty sure that's what that will be doing. Yeah, there's a tachometer diagram here so that's going to be something like that and the other one mct 1413p looks like a motorola device okay we have a data sheet what is it high current high voltage oh so these are darlington transistors each one effectively contains eight Darlington transistors. A Darlington transistor is basically that circuit. Yeah, so effectively, this is like a very high gain transistor. So the base voltage on this one will turn this on. So the current that's flowing from the base to the emitter is amplified by the gain of this transistor in the current between the collector and the emitter. So basically if the gain is 100, then the current flowing collector emitter is 100 times the base emitter. So if that, for example, gave a gain of 100, we now have flowing base emitter here, 100 times the input current. And again, it was multiplied, let's say by 100 collector emitter. So we multiply the two gains together, 100 times 100 is 10,000. So that's basically, what the circuit does, it just increases the gain by effectively multiplying the gain of the two transistors. Okay, and it's basically that. 
So that is just a load of transistors, eight of them. We have two of those. Let's have a look now, see if we can make any sense whatsoever of what we have here. Well, we have four relays. And they're all marked 12 volts. So this board obviously has a 12 volt supply somewhere. There's no large electrolytic capacitors on here. But there is a bridge rectifier there. You can see it. Yeah, plus minus. This is a bridge rectifier. This is the reset switch. We can see it's on the front panel. So this is probably... Because I don't see a large smoothing capacitor, it's not a part of a power supply. It's probably just, for some reason, we want a rectified AC, a pulsing DC, basically. So we have that. Um, which makes me think that the 12 volt supply to this board comes from off the board. Because you would assume, and I think it's a fair assumption, these chips all need a supply. Yeah, may well be 12 volts. And it needs to be smoothed. Yeah, but there's no smoothing capacitors on this. So it must come, the supply, somewhere from off the board. And it possibly comes through this. Now, I can't see how it would come through the bridge rectifier. Okay, I tell a lie. There's an electrolytic capacitor there. That might be wired across our bridge rectifier. Well, we can see one end of it goes to here is that supposed to be a connection from the bridge rectifier huh. it hopefully connects to the other side of the board the other end of the capacitor goes here no i don't think that's a smoothing capacitor as such 270 microfarad 35 volt it could be i mean this probably doesn't draw much current i guess the way to find out is to measure across here and see if it actually does go to our bridge rectifier that's the, one of the first things we can figure out i'm not sure it does okay so we can diode mode so i know the bridge rectifier is here i can see it i know that one end of it I'm pretty sure, I know, goes to the capacitor. Well, that goes to there. But no, this might well be the end of the bridge rectifier. That might be the other pin. No, I'm not sure at all that capacitor's connected to there. In fact, it seems to be connected to here, which makes me think this might well be a DC input, so I expect it. So the power for these chips probably comes externally. Uh, I think we might be able to figure that a little bit further, actually. This is the positive end of the capacitor, the one nearest me. So this is a negative end, which would make me think this is probably, assumedly, some sort of ground terminals. And the positive end, where does it go? It goes to that. No, that's a, di that's a diode coming in there. Uh, and that comes from here. No, this is ground. I'm a bit uncertain about that. That's the first strange thing I've found. Just diode here. I'm in diode mode. What's it saying? Ohms mode. But right, there's a 53 ohm resistance. Sorry, you can't see it. There's a 53 ohms resistance across that. And that's probably one of these resistors. Yeah, this one. And it's marked uh, 55R, so that's that. So that's why I'm reading all over there. This obviously is where the mess has happened. 
now he told me that this thing had exploded okay so I'm assuming that he has changed that so this is a voltage dependent resistor or it should be which a voltage dependent resistor basically conducts at a certain voltage so it's a very high value resistor which suddenly becomes a low value resistor and it should read open circuit which it does read open circuit okay let's start with this mess then because the problem is obviously here quite how far back into the circuit the problem has got i have no idea at the moment i'm not sure i'll be able to find out but the problem is obviously around here first thing then let's just zoom out a touch what I think I'll do then is to remove these resistors and possibly this bridge rectifier so I can get underneath here and have a good look to see what's happened. We know this is a 55 ohm resistor, it's marked on it and I can actually read it. Now this one's broke but if you see it's kind of like still attached yeah so what I'm hoping I can do is actually measure this resistor. Turn the resistance on to not on the continuity range. It's reading about 4 ohms. I think I'll try to remove this while it is still effectively not broken. On the hopeful chance I might be able to read the value of it. Yeah, this one here is marked so that one's not the problem again. Let's get some of this stuff off our board, yeah, so we can see what we've actually got here. It does look like somebody's made a very poor repair attempt on this already, to be quite honest. Which might not help matters at all. Okay. The first one, I'll try and get this one off, this, this intact one, so it's easier to get to the other one, okay, so... This appears to connect here. See if this is one end of our resistor. Wake the soldering iron up. Yeah, it does go there. Okay, I think I've actually pushed the resistor back into the board, or rather, out of the board, which would be good if I have. So, if that's one end of it, well, I'm not sure that is one end of it at all. Yeah, I think it is. But the other end must be over here somewhere, and you'd think it would be in line with that. Yeah, that end's come out, so that, that is definitely that end of the resistor. That is definitely that end of the resistor. It's soldered on both sides of the board. I can see it. I can see a track going to it. Okay, I've actually, I believe, got it off the board on this side. Not quite. It's still stuck in a little bit. So the other end, I have to come at it from this side. Let's get rid of this. This is like a quite clearly a screw that's stuck in the thing and jammed in you probably couldn't get it out uh, let's try, let's try get a pair of pliers on it so I get get this out of the way that'll help yeah that's helped That's one less thing in our way. Yep. Now let's see if we can get this thing out. I've lifted it. <coughs> oh, that solder's horrible. It fell out the board now, yeah, it fell out the board. 
Okay, so we can see where that came from. Uh, let's try a bit of braid. If not, we'll use the desoldering tool. Clean the uh, holes. Okay. Nice and clean. Other one. Or, or should I say other end? Is right down in front of this. I'm going to take this off the board. I need to see what's underneath it here. Yeah, I need to see what's underneath all this lot. See if we can get the uh, the broken one out of the board. Looks very burnt on this end. Let's see if we can do it. Probably come at it from this way. Skate in the end of the cutters for want of anything better. Okay, right out the board in one piece. That's what I really wanted to do. And now I can clean the board where it came from again. Try this. Okay. Okay. I mean this board is probably subjected to some high voltage to be quite honest. This looks charred down here, yeah, all this looks bad. A little bit of charcoal. I'm going to take this one off as well. It looks like it's damaged a bit here, but that's not the main reason. Because it's a low value resistor, it will probably prevent me from making any sensible readings around these diodes, yeah. So let's see if we can get S1 out as well. And I might go to it from this side actually. Nope, not easily. Try from the other side. So that's here. Okay. I've certainly cleared that side of it. Will it now come out? You can see it's soldered from this side as well. Yeah, I've left it out. Other end. Well, it comes across here actually. Yeah, I'd say that is it there. That oval shaped pad, it's in line with the other end where we've just come from here. We can uh, just clean this as well. Okay. So the other end is here. I'll let it solder. Yeah, I heard it fell out the board. I heard it fall out. Right, just drop that. Okay, so we can clean that as well. well that is clean. Other end's not very clean, so I had a bit of leaded soldering. I'll try again. Okay. That ends clean. Right. So now we can see a lot better what we have here. We have three resistors. One definitely needs replacing. So we need to figure out what it is. And then I'm going to get rid of this bridge rectifier as well. And then let's see if we can actually do anything. So I think it's going to be quite difficult to unsolder. I may also have to remove these actually. You can, it looks like this is some sort of previous repair here. We can obviously check the fuse as well. So we need to see if we can get this one out. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be too easy to do. 
So this leg isn't effectively soldered this side. Looks like somebody's tried to remove this before. Possibly failed. Yeah. There's one pad there, there's one here. And there's one here. Let's get that off with a bit of braiding. Let's see uh, see what we have here. See what we have. Um, yeah. I see a hole where it come, where it will come out from there at least. It looks like I might have desoldered that at least this side. Yeah. And then what the end? So if anything's holding that in place now, it's going to be holding on this side. And of course it is, I thought it would be. Okay. I think the only way to get this out, and I really do need to take it out so I can see under here what's going on, is going to be hot air from the other side of the board. And that's probably the only way to actually desolder that. I might have to hold this in a vise to do it. But we can try, yeah, we can try do it by hand so I'll probably need to put something heat resistant on okay yeah now I can get a hold of it let's see if we can get it out before it gets too hot to hold Nothing happening yet. This can take quite a bit of heat, not coming loose. No, nope, not really. No. Nope. No. Nope. I thought this would have come out a bit easier. No. That technique's not working too well. I might have moved this a little bit. Yeah. Let's try to persuade it to put something like this. So we'll get us underneath it, get some pressure against it, and let's go again. Yeah, got one end. Okay, I think I have it. 
Now, unfortunately, this is not working well. So what it's done is it's actually lifted a couple of tracks with it, but I can probably sort that out. So let me uh, see if I can effectively unsolder this leg. Yeah, I have done. My thing is stuck to the track. Okay, that's loose. One more. This is a really nasty PCB to work on. I can see it. Okay. Yeah, so I can just get a bit of uh, get my soldering iron in here. Okay. Come from this side. Okay. It's off. Well, there's our bridge rectifier removed. You don't see any pieces of track stuck to it, okay? And we can see that these two tracks are fine. This one comes from this here, and the piece that was stuck in the borders there, so we can flatten that back down again. This one, we can clean the hole. We can flatten it back down again, but there's a piece here that was completely missing. It's charcoaled. It's not stuck to the PCB. It's not stuck to the device. It was obviously burnt, so we needed to get that off there anyway. And we need to find a way just to uh, fix that bit of mess. But there was no other way, guys, unless... Well, of course there was another way. You guys tell me what it was, yeah? <laughs> of course there was another way. Okay, like so well, let's see if we can zoom down a little bit more on this. So this is the actual piece of track here. I'm fairly sure I can get that back into place. Okay. Yeah, that's back in place. And you can see, yeah, that this has gone. Yeah, this is burnt. This, this was no longer there. Just bits of it. Okay. So we need to fix that. And it's not going to be a very nice job because there's quite a bit of nasty on black stuff in here. And it looks like this has quite a high voltage. Okay, so... The VDR, I can see now the voltage dependent resistor, the MOV, yeah, metal oxide varistor, is a 431K, and that is like a 240 volt one, yeah. So we know the voltage that comes in here is 240 volt, and this is basically designed to go short circuit if the voltage is too high. Yeah, it blows that thing. i give you the part number. There, MD431K. We can look it up. I'm, I know that's a 240 volt AC, which is probably the same as like 430 volts DC. But I'm sure that's what the marking is actually. It's either 431. Uh, so 43 and 10, 430 volt. That's the peak voltage, not the RMS voltage. So I think you'll find. That is for a 240 or 250 volt AC. Yeah, that's in the right place. I can get that into it. That is. So we have one track there to replace. Okay. Now then, with that out of the way, let me see how much of this I can clean up. 
Okay. I'll use a bit of isopropyl. And we can test all these diodes now, I would say. And we can have a look to see what this is. I'm sure it's a transistor. We can test it. The same with these small transistors. And anything else we see around here, really check the fuse. Okay, let me try and clean it up. With that out of the way, we can start making a few measurements now. But we've definitely found one problem, which is that burnt out track, okay? So, the rectifier came out this way. So this end is the negative end, which you would assume is ground. Now, you probably noticed it's connecting to the anode of this diode, which you think, well, that's reverse biased then. And yeah, it is if this is a negative here, but I'd say that's probably a zener diode in this point. It was probably ground. You would think the negative end of the bridge rectifier would be ground. Um, we might be able to figure that out because if you look on these chips, ground, well, depending on what the chips are, I think it's on the middle of these. Is this one? Yeah, that is a diode junction. I'm not sure that is ground actually. It's hard to tell when you don't really have anything much to go by. Let's see. Well, it goes to all this area. Yeah, all this connects to that negative end of the bridge rectifier. So you'd have to assume because there's so much of it that's probably as ground actually. Yeah, probably as ground. Right, let's check the bridge rectifier first. So easy to do these really. Black lead to the positive, and then with the red lead in diode mode, we should get a diode junction from both AC inputs to here. Yeah, bit awkward. Okay, now if we go the other way with the black to the AC, we shouldn't get anything, it should read open. Okay, so from there to there, it's open, and that is open. Now we can go the other way. So with the red in the middle to the negative, they should read open. And open. And then the other way around, black to the AC, red to the negative, should be the diode junction. From both of them. Yeah, it does. And then... Positives and negative in the reverse direction, so the black to the positive will read like two diodes in series. Uh, we'll rough with that. And then the other way around, which is your actual the way it operates, positive, put the red lead, would read open. So that bridge rectifier reads okay. Let's look at some of these diodes around here then. So, That is short. Uh, that is short. That is like a diode. So this one is short. So we need to take that out. I'll take that out now because it will probably make it difficult to take all the readings. Okay. Let's have a look. So where does it go to? I can see from the bridge rectifier one end in fact is here which is this pin I might decide to use a solder sucker but let's give it a go okay and this must be the other end. This looks a bit burnt. Probably related to the fact it was short. Okay. So, see if we can uh, take it out. See if we can get it out. Again, it's probably easier from this side. Let's get under here. See if I get a bit more solder on it.
Now, when you do this, you should make a note which way these round they go and where they came from. I might actually have the video recording so I can refer back to it. But let's just get it out. If I can, easily. This really is not a nice PCB to work on. Yeah, just doesn't want to unsolder. Let's try some desolder braid. Okay. Okay. Now let's see if we can remove it. Uh, put something just under the edge of it. I can effectively work like a weaver. Can we get this end to unsolder and not take the track with it? Yeah, you see it's sticking to it. Horrible PCB to work with. You sometimes find this, guys. Some PCBs are just not good, yeah. The, the tracks are not stuck well to the substrate, basically, yeah. Yeah, you see it doesn't want to come. There, I've got it. Uh, other end. Try the same technique. Okay, that one came out easily. Well, let's see what we have there. I'll just clean this first so it's easy to see where it came from. I'm not sure the vacuum desoldering tool would help with this PCB, just isn't nice. Again, it seems to be a bit charred in there, I don't think that's helping either. Okay. It's alright though, the pads are all still on there. Okay, so this diode feels not very good bzy58c i can tell you now this is a zener diode it's probably a 22 volt yeah bzv sorry bzv58c22 let's see what it is 22 volt zener for sure just not sure what wattage it is okay bzv58c 22 uh, data sheet. It might be a 1 watt 22 volt. Let's see. Uh, it's a Zenith diode, alright. I knew that much anyway, as you could see. Uh, all data sheet. That's a Spanish site. Well, we actually have some data sheets here, don't we? Let's see. Okay. It's a 5 watt. Zenit, I do not have any of these, therefore I do need to order parts of this. 5 volt Zenit, BZV58. Fun enough, I do not see the C22. Okay. Let's go find another data sheet. Well, this page says page not found, yeah, but it does actually say here uh, BZV58 C22 is 22 volt yeah, and 5 watt. So we know what it is, okay? Can we get such things off AliExpress? Well, I've searched for that part number, no, but these are probably just obsolete. I think if we put 22 volt 5 watt Zenith, I can probably find.
Looks like I can. Okay, so there we have it. 1M5358B. That's the equivalent. So I can get the parts for about five euros for that one. Right, let's continue looking. Before I continue though now, because I'm starting to take quite a few things off this PCB, we need to make some notes. So I've actually printed it out, a picture of it. So this here, we know is the bridge rectifier. The bridge, take it to the bridge, positive end, negative end. Okay, this is where our diode was fitted. Here, it went um, to Zenith, so this ends the negative. Zenith diode, that goes there. And that is the uh, 5 watt 22 volt. So we know what that is. Now let's just look at these resistors while we're at it then. So we take three resistors off the board. Uh, one of them came from across here. Okay, one of them came from there. So that is the 56 ohm resistor. So let's make a note of that as well. That's from here to here. 56 ohm, sorry tell I, 55 ohm, okay that's that one, we have two more, uh, this was one of the other ones which comes from, let me see again, this is why you need to do this, Yes, it came from here. I had to refer myself then actually to the recording. So this is why you need to do this. Because if you remember now, by the time you've ordered some parts, you probably won't remember. This is a 0 or 5 or half ohm, 0.5 ohm resistor. So we can put that on our diagram, which goes across here. Here. Yeah, to there. Okay, zero or five. And then in front of that was the burnt one, which actually straddles over that zenith diode we've just done. So that one goes from here to here. Okay, and this one is the one that is trashed. But we need to check the other ones while we're at it because we have to order at least one resistor. So let's have a look. This one I'm pretty sure we measured in circuit was okay, but we can double check it. So, uh, in fact, it is 56, not 55. That reads fine. It is 56 ohms. So that's okay. The 0.5 ohm resistor, we can check this one. So let's see from here to here. Reads, yeah, close enough. So that's okay. The Zenodide was bad, obviously. And then this resistor is bad, but I want to see if we can actually measure the resistance because there's no way we're going to be able to get the markings from it. Let's see. Well, that's reading 3.8, so 3.9 is a standard value, so I think we're going to have to say that as a 3.9 ohm resistor. Let's use this one. 3R9. What wattage is it? Well, that's anybody's guess, but let's see what we can find. I mean, 10 should be more than enough, and it maybe is a 5 watt resistor. It looks possibly like a 5 watt. Do we know what these other ones are? Say DH on them. We could Google it. Let's just Google one of these and try to assume maybe it's the same wattage. DH 56R resistor. See if that tells us anything. Uh, not really. 5 watt. Shall we try power resistor DH and see if that gives us any 
kind of oh yeah power resistor DH56 yeah 15 watt what's a 5.6 unfortunately didn't come up with anything not very useful well that is a 15 watt so it says it looks different but it's marked dh so that's a 15 watt so let's assume it's something like that i mean we have quite a bit of space in here so 3.9 ohm 3 r 9 15 watt uh, let's see if we can find something. This may be overkill. It might not be such a high wattage. Well, there's some 10 watt ones. These, I believe, come in 18 watt. These golden droppers. So, possibly one of those. These are 25 watt. And do they come in? You know, they, well, they come in four, which is close enough. Yeah, they come in four. That's close enough to what I'm reading on it. So I think if we put one of these in, I, we can't go really wrong. I think that would probably... I, I know they need a heat sink to handle the full wattage, but I think they'll be okay. Sometimes, guys, you just kind of have to guess a little bit. If you over egg it, it's not a problem. If it's a higher wattage than you need, that certainly isn't going to cause a problem. If it's a lower wattage than you need, you'll soon know about it. Okay, so what else can we test on here? Well, obviously there's lots more diodes, but I just want to check a couple of other things. So I can see the power comes in here. There's no short there. Just put on to continuity mode. There we go. So the power then should go across to the AC. So that's power coming in, that's good, so those tracks are fine. And that's the other AC, so the tracks are good. But this one are gone. You can see it's all gone. So we have two more diodes here, so let's check these. Oh, sorry, I forgot I mentioned the fuse. Let's check the fuse while we're at it. Well, I don't really need to remove the fuse, I can just check it, yeah. That's where the fuse is. Looks like the fuse is good. Come on, let's double check. Yeah. Does the fuse read okay? No. Yes, fuse does read okay. Yeah, there's a bit of a bad connection. So fuse is good. Okay. Right, more semiconductors. Semiconductors are the most likely thing to fail. If resistors have failed, usually in this sort of circumstances, they've burnt up, yeah. So usually you know. Right. So diode junctions. Diode mode. Okay. What we got? I said diode junction reads okay. Reads open. They might not always read open the other way. That's a diode junction reads okay. Yeah. So diode junction, probably a shot key diode reading really like that. No, so we need to take that one out to double check it. Always lift one end of it. That reads okay. There's some little ones. Uh, it reads more the other way, so it probably is just okay. That reads oh no, it reads like the other one. Okay, that's fine. They're probably in parallel. So this one is quite. Oh no, what's it reading now? That's reading okay. This one. Yeah, this is the one. So this one 
at least we need to lift one end of it if we don't actually take it out of the board. Let's see if we can do it from this side again. A bit of leaded solder. Okay. I'll just clean this up on here. Okay. Try the little uh, thing under the edge of it. Other end. Okay. No, it's not coming easily, so I need to do the other side as well. Don't try and strain these things. It's not going to help. I mean, if you break it, you can replace it if you know what it is, but you don't really know if it was faulty then, do you? So it's not a good idea to break them. If you can avoid it, yeah. Let's have another go. It does seem to have a part number on it at least. Yeah. That's out, I think. Let's see. Yeah, that's out of the board, alright. Okay. Check it. So this side weight should conduct, should be a diode. Now it reads like a normal diode this way. Doesn't so. There's probably around here across this somewhere some low value resistor. Yeah. Bit hard to say, but there must be, I'm assuming. Because we get this reading. Yeah, what's that in resistance range? Always have a look at resistance range, see what it is, see if it's something sensible. Yeah, a couple hundred ohms. Okay, I think we can live with that for the moment. Diode mode. Is this a diode? Looks a bit like a diode. Looks like the stripes at this end of the shoot should read this way. Yeah, it does, I'm fairly happy with that. This is probably another one of these Zener diodes. Well, that means I can diode that way, but it shouldn't do. You'd expect it to be this way. Yeah, so this one again, I will lift one end and have a look to see if it's okay. Yeah, that's there. Lifting one end is quite handy because you can always lay them back down again afterwards. Don't forget, yeah, or make a marking on your diagram that where you've lifted them. And while we're at it, let's make a note of that bad track where it's obviously faulty. Okay, let's go on this one. Okay. Probably require a little bit of persuasion from this side as well. is out yeah let's see what this one reads this is quite a handy technique guys if you hadn't thought of it or you didn't know it reads like a diode this way you should read open yeah that seems that's fine itself let's get on it uh, we can just check these switches I find somewhere should be a contact and then push the switch. No, it's still a contact. Let's try this. Yeah, the switch works. This one, uh, the big one, I'll try when I get a bit further down the board. Try to work methodically as we're working inwards. Uh, there's another word of diodes near this edge, so let's just check. That's all these ones over here. 
reads the 156 again. You know what I think I'm reading? I think it's the relay coils. You would expect to find a diode across a relay coil. Uh, these across the relay coils. We can use this point to test the relays. Uh, that one isn't. But it reads like a diode. Yes. Couple more. Yeah, it reads like a diode. It reads like a diode. So we've got one here. And we've got three here that all read this like one fifty-six, yeah. We've got four relay coils, so does that make sense? Yeah, it looks like the relay coils here. And this one's the other way around. Let's have a look. If these relays read the same across them, and we can say with confidence that's what we're actually reading. Yeah, was that a good guess or what? Was that a good guess, guys? Yeah. Well, this one actually reads open. What about this one? Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. So that means the 156. That means the 156, same as those diodes. And I've got two more relays here. And it looks like this is where the coils are from the same layout of the other one. No, it reads okay now. Yeah, okay. So I'm pretty sure that's what those are. And in fact, I think we could actually find the end of the diode and we'll see that's where they go to. Let's have a quick look. That comes over to here. Yeah, it looks like they go across these diodes all right. Yeah, we got the same resistance anyway. So we could, we know the positive end of the relay coil is going to be where the bar is because it's like reversed, biased, biased across them to stop any sort of like spikes. So from here to here, we should be able to stick our bench power supply and switch these relays on. One, two, three. And the fourth one appears to be here. Okay. So we can check that. What else can we check? Two transistors here. Yeah, let's check these transistors. As you're working our way across the board. So, quite commonly this is the base. But it might not be. This looks like a higher value resistor. So this is a high value resistor, this is probably the base pin. Let's go into diode mode. Yeah, 60k. So I'm guessing the middle one is the base, because it has the highest value resistor on it. But if you didn't know, you could still work it out. But that's a useful thing to, to know. Have we got a diode junction here? No. What about here? Yes. How about the other way around? Could be a PMP. No. No. So I have a junction from here to here. And from there to there. So that's looking more like this is the base at this end. I'd say it's probably worth taking that one out and testing. Let's have a quick look at the other one. Yeah, it's looking the same as that, so I think they're probably okay, actually. So, this end being this end, turn around. No, oh, I'm not so sure. Quite possibly got an MPN and a PMP. I think it's worth taking them out and testing. And while we have it, what do we see on this one? So this BDX, I'm sure, is a transistor. Reads like a junction there. Reads like a junction there. I wouldn't have expected it to quite read like that. 
means like a junction it means like a junction so we need to take all these three out it's the only way to really eliminate them I and mean, as we're moving further down here i suspect there probably isn't going to be problems but i would at least like to test all the diodes and transistors at the least yeah you can hear the the soldering tool now i've been doing all this with solder braid so far but i think with these transistors and all honesty the desoldering tool is going to be a better option so a bit of leaded solder on there it sounds fairly clear but i'll just uh, run the little cleaning stick through it uh, it's a little bit clogged just there it was yeah, it's gone easy enough sounds clear now okay let's try and get these off so good this PCB is with this well interesting two of the legs don't actually seem to go through the holes at all and seem to be sold as much from this side as the other side now it's clogged yeah it's got a bit clogged it's been doing this a lot recently ah oh, go in there yeah I might just buy a new one of these handles it's probably worth having a spare one anyway because you never know one day it will break and they're not too expensive to buy yeah that is really not happy let's try heating the end of the rod with the hot air and sticking that through it Okay, try that. I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with that later. Let's stick with the old technology. I think this is pretty much out anyway actually Let's see if we can do it from this side like we did with the other things okay. yeah that's out that's out I think this one is basically out anyway. Yeah. Okay. Might be a bit warm. Let's check it. Okay. Darlington transistor. Diode protection machine collection emitter. Resistor shunt machine basically emitter can't measure the gain right I'm just going to check this really is actually a Darlington transistor just occasionally I have seen this thing give erroneous readings with them I just want to be sure that really is what it is so it's a BDX34C well it does actually appear to be a Darlington transistor so fair enough I can live with that so I'll put this back in again and then we can check the other two transistors around here as well. 
Okay, so this is the first of the small transistors. Uh, C557 eight or B probably five five seven eight two SC would be the actual part number let's see if it's good I think that's the PMP I'm trying to remember which way around A is PMP 2SB is NPN I think C is also PMP let's have a look here I think it actually read like a PMP in circuit another one like an NPN let's have a look Yeah, PMP transistor, it's good. So that can go back in in a moment. In fact, you know, actually it can go back in now so I don't get them mixed up. Uh, let's see where it came out from. Just a little bit fiddly. It says, it's this PCB, the solder's not nice. The whole thing isn't nice to be quite honest to work on. But you know, you get this, it happens. So we can just bend these back into a, a sensible direction. We might just get it straight back in again. No, let's clean up the hole some more. Give it a bit of proper solder and then clean the holes out again. Okay. There's probably somebody somewhere saying I should use lead free solder on this. All I can say about lead free solder, I think it's like certain road junctions. You know when you get like to a road junction where it's more of a conspiracy than a junction. So like as one light goes on green, the other one goes on red, yeah. I've seen junctions like that that you really can't navigate easily. And I have this theory. Apart from his soldering iron, that's my other theory. Soldering iron had done down. I have this theory that whoever designs those road junctions don't have to use them themselves and they should be forced to navigate that junction every day until they replace it with something better. Yeah, in the meantime, the pads come off. You see how bad this board is? And it really is the board. I've worked on many, many, many boards over the years. Fortunately, I can actually solder this on the other side, and that's what I'm actually going to do. Because you can see, there's no tracks going to the transistor on this side of the board, yeah. Anyway, so, I also have a theory that whoever invented lead-free solder doesn't solder, yeah. Nobody would have invented that if they ever actually have to solder stuff. That is my honest opinion. It was invented by somebody who doesn't have to use it. Yeah. That's my reckoning. And that shouldn't be allowed, yeah? It shouldn't be allowed. It's like film sensors, yeah? Anybody who wants to be a film sensor should be automatically disqualified from being a film sensor because the only reason anybody ever wants to do that sort of job is because they have some sort of moral axe to grind, yeah? So this should therefore be automatically eliminated from ever doing it. It should be done like by like some random jury that they pick out on the street. In fact, actually, no, it shouldn't. It should be like, well, if you want to watch it, watch it. And if you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. And don't complain about other people who do. Yeah, that's my, that's my opinion about it. Censorship, yeah. You say, this film contains this, this and this. And it's entirely up to you if you watch it or not. Yeah. But don't complain about other people who do if you don't want to. It's just, you know. It's good manners, yeah. It's good manners. Right. You can tell I'm obviously getting 
stressed out by the solder on this board because I'm starting to rant about random things, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I always do that when I start to get stressed by stuff like this and I don't like this PCB. I don't like to work on it. But the job has to be done, yeah. Job has to be done. Same problem. I think this is why the solder stuff are clogged as well because of this stuff. I had a lot of fun getting the other one out in one piece. I think I'm actually pushing it through the board now. I think that click and that creaking here and the legs of the transistor actually going through the board. So can we get it from this side? This is how I did the other one. I'll show you this time how I did it. So I came in with a soldering iron on the leg and used my finger in a rather risky position to do that with it. Uh, that's how I did it. Same with this one. It's a bit warm right now, so I have to let it cool slightly. Yeah, you the little creak. This is how I got the other one out in one piece. Of course, I wasn't using the camera at the time, so this one will not come out in one piece just to prove that. Yeah. Yeah. See, it go quick on that one. This is coming. Cool. It's not coming easily, like, it's not giving any. <laughs> It's not giving up easily, but it is coming. Okay. Right, that's loose now. See it? Uh. Okay. So what we need to do now is get hold of the third leg. Which is loose. Mm. Well, it's loose, it's not coming out. Let's go from the other side now. Middle leg. Okay, right. Got it. The main thing is it came out in one piece. See what we wanted. So, let's have a look. Which leg is which? Is it good? This looks a bit like an MPN in circuit, it might well be. Yeah. Oh, a digital transistor. So, okay. so a digital transistor is one that has a resistor in series with the base. If this is not a digital transistor, I don't trust it. Okay. What is it? Well, in actual fact, it isn't a transistor at all. It's a voltage reference. LM431. That's what it is. It's an LM431. Okay, just out of interest, I just tried another one. This is a TL431. And it actually thinks it's a digital transistor. An NPN digital transistor. So that tells me the one is probably okay. I'll stick it back in. This time I managed to get the holes clean. Obviously the rant worked, yeah. The rant worked. Bit 
bit of solder on that. Okay, and I'll just clean this up a little bit. Okay, so that's clean. You probably hardly even see where I took the components out. Um, I have to just look myself to see where they were. One, that was the TL431. Spit something on there, doesn't need to clean it off. Okay, and then this is the other one here, the PMP transistor. Okay, so we know all those are okay. Again, I can just clean this area up. There we go. Right, what else do we have? We have a lot of LEDs, but I don't think they would actually stop it working. So I could try them, but I just want to keep working my way a little bit further back on this. At least now, just to see if I see any shorts. I think I'm far enough away from this lot. We'll have to worry about exactly every reading, but if I see any short circuits, I'll certainly be having a look to see what's causing them. Okay, so let's continue. So we have a diode here. Are we on diode mode yet? Reads okay. Another one here, this way around. Reads okay. Um, we have some transistors again, or similar, at least we can check for junctions around these. Okay. One junction there. Another junction there, this is probably the base, so that sort of makes sense. So this might be M different. MP, 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 yeah, let's go the other way. It's another little complementary pair of transistors. Yeah, junction. No, I don't see a junction there. Maybe this is the base on this one. Uh, yeah, it looks like it. And very similar readings. Base collector, base emitter. We have another one around here, so we can check this one. Uh, looks okay. Uh, we have a couple of opto isolators over here. Don't really see any particular reason why they would have a problem. Although we could take them out and test them. Let's just check these LEDs. So yeah, they probably light up actually, at least dimly. If we get them the right way around. No, actually it doesn't, but it does read. Yeah, it reads like a diode 1.7. No, it is light, you don't just have to look straight down like that's all. It is lighting up, and if you can see it, I can see it. Probably looks too dim with this light, it's lighting up. That one's lighting up as well. Okay. Have a look at these. Probably read a higher reading on the yellow ones. Might not light up. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me with this meter. I don't think it reads the yellow ones. Untangle this one. Try another yellow one. 
1.7 that's what you'd expect it to read something like that what's this one read nothing that way One point seven, that's what you expect it to read. But it's lighting up, you can probably see it. Green one. One point one nine. Nothing the other way, okay. It's just green one read. Oh, that reads a bit low. A bit lower than I'd expect. 1.09. I'll put my little uh, tester on. It just sends a milliamp into it. This is my LED tester. It sends one milliamp into them. Yeah, connection oh yeah see it lit, lit up yeah this is an easier way to test them in a better way yeah it's lighting up and because it's only sending one milliamp and the voltage is effectively the voltage of the led it's not really a problem i'll just check all the others it's a little bit time consuming i'll just check them and i'll let you know if any of the other leds read bad but i suspect they're probably good yeah they all read the same so basically all the green ones in the forward direction, read 1.175, is it? Another one. 1.75. And the yellow ones all read 1.71 to another one. Yeah, so they all read the same, basically. So I'd say all these LEDs are okay. Yeah. The last thing I think that to check, I think we pretty much proved everything we can prove. We can't see any other physical damage. All the problems seem to be around here. We found a burnt out track, which I'm pretty confident was burnt out. You can tell me I did it if you like. We definitely found a short circuit Zenit. And I definitely didn't do that. So that's where the problems seem to be. The fuse is okay. We'll just check these relays will actually switch over, I think. So... The way to do this is just to put some voltage on the diodes which are across them so we know which diodes they are which is these three and the one that I lifted up there yeah and we put the positive to the stripe of the diode and the relay should click over so let's try I've got my power supply here I've got a couple of leads attached to it I've just set the current I short it to 270 milliamps that's probably enough to switch it resist it and hopefully not enough to blow something up if I do this wrong so red to the positive end of the diode black to the negative end yeah do you see it? you'll have to see because my hand's in the way see it switching there Okay, this one switches this one. This goes with a nice clunk. This goes with a tick, but it's a different type of relay. Internally, you can see that. And the next one, with this one at this end. Yeah. That's switching. Let's go back to this one. Well, that looks like the same type as that. But. but not a positive sound, yeah. I think this is this one, which is a different type you can see, actually. Yeah. And the last one is this diode here, okay? That's this one switching, you can see it. So they're all working, this one's a little bit suspect, is it the same type as the other one? 021 
O2T, something or other. Uh, O2T, something or other. I'm just not sure about this one. I can see the contact moving. I can see the contact moving. But I don't know why it makes a completely different sound from the other one. Uh, you can hear it. Not too happy with that. If you look inside the relay as well, you see like this is kind of like all charred, where this is clean and shiny, and yet these are both the same type. Uh, they say Finder O2. I'll better focus it for you. Actually, you'll see what they say. Uh, Finder O. Finder ten. Two. No, find a 02 type 40.61. That's those two. These are a slightly different type. Focus these again. But these have nice shiny contacts in them and they make a good clunk. This one just doesn't sound right to me. It may be working, but I'm really not sure I would trust it. Yeah. So. Can we get some of these? I think we probably can. Oh, here we go. So, yes, this is the one, the same colour. Finder 40.61. Yeah. And they're like four euros each. I mean, I, I would order at least a couple of my probably replace both of them, actually. So, we can get the parts. So, I'm going to replace that really as well. I'll just show you uh, on paper how I knew that these diodes were connected to these relay coils, what they're doing there, and how I knew which polarity was the correct polarity for the relay coil. I've also fixed this now, so I've soldered the wire there, that's where the track was gone, between the two. But it's going to be very difficult to refit the bridge rectifier in here. There's not enough space to get in there to solder it. And from this side, you can see, and you saw the previous work, the pads have gone here as well. There's no pads there. So it's going to make that difficult to do. But there's a much easier way to fix that. And that is to replace this bridge rectifier with four individual diodes of the same rating. To work that out I actually looked up the data sheet for this bridge rectifier and this is a 5 amp 200 volt bridge rectifier which is interesting because it makes me think that this varist, this MOV metal oxide varist, which is connected across the AC terminal, so that's connected across the AC input, appears to be rated for mains voltage to 40 volts or more, and this is less, it's 200. So I honestly don't know if that is the correct value varista that has been fitted in there. And obviously the original one was burnt, so whoever fitted this, he doesn't know, and I don't know. But I suspect that's probably the wrong value, so it won't have the protection it should have. The only real way to figure that out would be to put this on the machine and measure the voltage across here. And if, for instance, it was like 80 volts, fit a 100 volt one or something like that. But it's not going to be easy to, to really figure that one out. The other thing is this switch. So, I haven't tested the switch, but I need to do that. And particularly because the owner suggested there might be a problem with it as well. So let's have a look at the switch. Okay. So it's a six position switch. There's 12 pins and two in the middle. So we can assume these two are the center pole. 
and they appear to be connected together so that might be fine i mean it may just well be that they're using both poles together to double the current rating of the switch basically so from here we should have a connection to one of these depending which position and probably to two if they use them parallel probably a connection to two of them actually and we don't have yeah so let's just change the position of the switch which I can do with a pair of pliers so that's position one two three I can even click four five there are six positions you can hear it clicking I've moved it to the other end let's try that Again, these are connected together. I don't think that will change. So, once again, it appears to be open circuit to go into all of the positions. Yeah. You can just try each position in turn. That's position number two. And once again, we don't have any connection to any of them, which makes me think this switch is actually completely open circuit so i'm going to have to take the switch off the board as well and given the problems i've had with this board it's not going to be easy so i've cleared out the solder sucker which clogged up earlier i actually dismantled it to do it you can see it here yeah and i had to get hot air there's a piece of solder stuck on the end of there that just would not clear even with this at the maximum temperature still quite warm now I'm just letting it cool down and then let's see if we can get this switch off while that's cooling down let's have a look at the diodes and the relays we were just talking about okay so relays a relay basically has a coil which is wrapped around a metal former something that will magnetize iron most likely and this forms an electromagnet so when you pass current through the coil it will magnetize in one direction if you pass the other it will magnetize in the other direction and it has effectively a little metal lever like this which pivots so when you pass current through the coil it magnetizes the lever comes down that pushes outwards and it operates a switch so this will push against the switch contact okay there's another switch contact and it might be more than two could be double pole single pole but it pushes on the switch contact and effectively makes the contact so that's how the relay works and to do that normally you will have a positive supply and we know these relays are 12 volts so plus 12 and we switch the other end through a transistor normally to ground okay thus making the circuit this will be controlled by whatever is controlling the relay and the transistor provides the current that the relay needs so that's how the circuit works you put a voltage on here this effectively becomes a short and it magnetizes the coil but this relay is a coil and any coil is an inductor okay and an inductor has inductance and we've talked about this before but it's important here so let's talk about it again and this takes us back to the water wheel so then the water wheel which i always find a bit difficult to draw okay one water wheel and this is basically what an inductor does an analogy of yeah so i would relay is the load the pipe here yeah. this is our relay and our transistor is a switch a valve here okay that can open or close yeah and we have here 
a pump. And it completes the circuit. Uh, so, the pump is putting pressure on the water wheel. Uh, pressure. But when the valve is closed, no water can flow. That's your current. Yeah. The pump represents the voltage. So, no water can flow. When we open the valve, water can start to flow through the circuit. Yeah. It's a continuous loop water circuit, yeah? The pump is pumping. So what happens? Does the water just start flowing? Well, no, it doesn't. And the reason being that this water wheel is heavy. It has inertia. It needs force to get it going. And it starts to rotate slowly and gradually picks up speed, okay? So the pump is putting pressure onto the water wheel. And the wheel starts to rotate. Okay. And once it starts to rotate, some water comes through the circuit. And that activates our relay. Okay. Once the water wheel starts spinning, it speeds up. The pump is still putting pressure on it. So it starts to spin faster and faster and faster. And after a short period of time, the water wheel is now running at its maximum speed. The water is flowing freely yeah. and the pressure difference between here plus and minus is low because the water is flowing. Previously when the water wheel wasn't rotating we had a high pressure here and a low pressure here. Yeah. Once it gets running the pressure difference is practically zero. Yeah, We have a free flowing circuit. What happens when you switch the valve off. Yeah. We close the valve. Yeah, what happens? Well, obviously, no water can continue to flow anymore. We've broken the circuit. We switched it off. Well, this water wheel is very heavy. So this water wheel will try to keep on rotating. It has a lot of energy, inertia, yeah. And it will have to stop because it can only compress the water here so much but at the point you switch this off this end of the water wheel becomes the high pressure end coming out of it yeah and this end becomes the low pressure end because the water can no longer flow so basically at this point it puts a massive strain on the valve if the valve cannot withstand the pressure from the water wheel before we can stop the valve will go or blow yeah if it can't this will come to a screeching halt yeah so that's basically how the how the water analogy works and an inductor is very much like the water wheel so when you switch this transistor on this end has the positive pressure but we now call it voltage yeah the positive voltage is here and the current like the water starts to flow through the coil but this magnetic core is mag can magnetize so the current that's flowing into it has to be used to magnetize the core okay while that core is magnetizing you've got current flowing in but practically no current flowing out like the water wheel you have current going into it but nothing coming out of it you're building up pressure so this gradually magnetizes and to be on this gradually, I mean like in microseconds probably, yeah. Milliseconds, depends on the size of the coil. Once this is fully magnetized, it's like this water wheel running at the full speed. And all the current can now flow down here through the transistor. Yeah. And the only limit to the current is the resistance of the winding. Okay? It's flowing freely. Like the only limit here was effectively how much capacity of water can go through the water wheel at full speed. Yeah. So that's what happens. What happens when we switch this transistor off? Well, suddenly you break the circuit here. Yeah. Physically it's connected. I've probably drawn it in the wrong place. Suddenly you break the circuit here. Yeah, in the transistor. The transistor is now off. Yeah. No more current can flow through the transistor. 
But just like the water wheel, this has electrical inertia. This magnetic field now will collapse because there's no more current flowing through the coil. Uh, and as it collapses, it turns back into electric current or pressure. And the same thing happens here. When you break the current, this end of the coil becomes the high pressure end, the high voltage end compared with that end. Okay? But this end is still connected to 12 volts. Yeah, this is still connected to 12 volts. So the voltage here can't drop, but the pressure's got to go somewhere. So what happens is the voltage at this end rises to more than 12 volts. And if you switch this off suddenly, the field collapses suddenly, that can rise into the hundreds of volts. Yeah. This transistor is probably designed to switch a 12 volt circuit. So there's a very good chance you'll just blow the transistor. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll blow it short or open. The transistor will go short usually. So that problem is called back EMF. And to stop this happening, all we need to do is give the pressure, the voltage, somewhere to go. And the way we do it is this. We put a diode across the coil connecting back to the other end. Okay. The diode is reverse biased. So when we first switch on again, we'll switch on. Yeah, we'll fix our transistor. We'll switch it back on again. We'll replace the one we've just blown up with a good one. And we'll switch it on. This end of the coil is effectively connected via the transistor to zero volts. Or very close to it there'll be a little bit of voltage drop across the transistor this end of the diode has now got plus 12 volts so the diode can't conduct a diode conducts positive to negative in the direction of the arrow so while the tran re while so while the relay is switched on that diode is not conducting it's reversed bias to the positive is at the wrong end of the diode it can't conduct yeah we switch our transistor off again yeah what will happen now well the same the field will collapse but the pressure now has got somewhere to go because suddenly this end of the diode is as a voltage more than 12 volts yeah as i just described so the diode now conducts and all the pressure goes back to the other end of the coil so while the relay is operating, the current flows this way, uh, through the relay, through the transistor to there. Yeah, that's messy, isn't it? Let's do it again. When the relay is conducted, the transistor is on, the current flows here, through our transistor to here. Yeah. And when the transistor switches off, the current now flows through the coil and back through the diode to the end of the coil. So it's a pressure valve. Yeah. And it doesn't do anything in normal operation until the relay switches off and then it does what it needs to do. So all the relays will have a diode across them wired like this. They have to have, otherwise the circuit can't work. This relay coil to your multimeter is quite a low resistance, maybe 100 ohms or something, or tens of ohms, hundreds of ohms, depends on the winding. And that low resistance appears across this diode to your multimeter that's how i knew when i found four diodes well i found three at first with a low resistance across them i knew instinctively they were connected across the relay coils okay the other thing i knew is which end of the diode is the positive supply and which end is ground and i knew because the cathode Reverse bias diode will go to the positive. Okay. The other thing I just mentioned was about replacing that bridge rectifier. Just for physical reasons, I can't easily refit it. But a bridge rectifier internally is made up of four diodes. And there's no reason why you can't just replace it with four individual diodes, which will be much easier to solder. All you need to do is put the diodes the right way around. So this is your bridge rectifier. This is one of your AC inputs. Okay. 
and this has a diode like such there which feeds that way yeah the other AC input is here okay and basically when this end of the AC is positive the diode conducts when this end of the AC is positive this diode conducts so this end will always get the positive voltage and then once you've drawn that, it's easy to draw the other ones because the two diodes go the opposite way around. Okay? So now we have it. When this end of the AC is positive relative to that end, this diode conducts. When it's negative relative to this end, this diode conducts. Okay? So this gets the negative. Same here. When this one is positive with relation to that end, this diode conducts. And when it's negative with relation to that end, this diode conducts. This always gets the negative, and this always gets the positive. So we can take four diodes, at least 5 amp 200 volt, which is the rating of the bridge rectifier, or more. We can put those four diodes in wired like that. These are the to AC, this is the negative, this is the positive, so we can wire the diodes in, and because these separate diodes, we've got plenty of room to get in here and solder, okay? So that's why I'm replacing that with four diodes. While we've been doing that, the solder sucker has warmed up. Let's have a look at to get a switch off. To have much chance of removing this, we're gonna have to put some wedded solder on. I'll try to use the solder sucker. I may have to use hot air from the rear side. It may not come off in one piece at all, but it's got to come off one way or the other, and preferably with the PCB still in one piece afterwards. So I'm more concerned about the board than I am about the switch. The noise you can hear is the desoldering gun. So first of all, let's add leaded solder on all of the pins. I'll try not to add flux because it just tends to clog up the desoldering tool. Obviously there is flux in the solder. So we have those two pins and then we go all the way around it. Okay, will it desolder? Running clear, yeah, let's try. Get plenty of heat into it. It's not fitting easily over the legs of the switch. It's not going to come out this way, I'll tell you now. I can remove the excess solder. That one looks reasonably clean. That looks reasonably clean. Let's give it a bit of help as well. Let's just warm this up somewhat with the hot air. This will give it the best chance of actually working. Okay. Don't want to get too hot but I like to get some heat into it. And that's clogged up again. It's got to be this solder, this old 
unwedded soul that's clogging this up. I'm going to add it completely clear. Move that out of the way. Yeah, so it's, it's clogging at this end. Okay. Well, I'll try and get this thing to clear, which I'll probably have to dismantle it again. I've just turned it up to its maximum temperature, but it doesn't seem to be helping much. I'll get a bit of heat into it. I'll try and remove all the solder with braid and then add leaded solder again and see if this will actually then remove it without clogging up. Okay, so we actually get it to clear. Yeah. Okay, I've managed to clear it this time. Okay. It's quite evident that my desoldering gun does not like the type of solder that was on here. So when we move it and then, as I say, we'll try another way.
Okay. That's not good enough to take it out, but I've got rid of all the excess solder. So again, I'm going to re-solder all the pins just with leaded solder this time. So we don't have that effect of the alloy of the two. And then let's see if the solder sucker will now do it. If this doesn't do it, then we'll have to resort to hot air. Okay. Once again, I'll just warm the air we go. To have the best chance of actually being able to do it. That should be fairly warm. Right. Still sucking, but I will just uh, run the cleaner through it again. Yeah, that's clean. So you can see it's not the tool, it's not the technique, it's the mixture of leaded and lead free solder, especially what is on this board. is not good. That sounded good. Go back on this one again. Okay. Still quite clear. Go on this one again. Still really clear. The two in the middle. This one hasn't so unsoldered. Went better that time. Yeah. Try this one again. 
I'll just give it another warm round these middle two. Okay. Now let's try. Much better, yeah. Much better. Well, let's just let it just cool a bit. I'll just get a bit of ice so, so I can have a good look at that. Maybe this will come out now without the hot air. Yeah. And we've learnt something about that, yeah. Guys, when you're doing this sort of work, take your time, okay? Don't rush. And by take your time, I don't mean leave it sitting with the soldering iron on the pad for five minutes, okay? I can see straight away that these are not clear, but I've removed most of the solder. So I think now I can probably extract this using hot air. So I'm gonna clamp the board in a vise get hot air on the back and just literally pull the switch off yeah I mean, it's a little bit loose now so some of the pins are actually have come loose but bear in mind there are tracks on this side going under it which i really really do not want to damage yeah so i don't want to just try and pull this off the board okay let's try it so to do this you need to put the board in something solid i've got it just into a bench vise just on this bottom edge so in fact I'm clamping across the connectors, just give them something to grip onto. Not too tight, obviously. So here is our switch. And I can now get the hot air from behind this and I should be able to just take this off the board. That's the theory. I'll switch the uh, solder sucker off now, don't need that. That's the theory. Let's see if we can do it. But I don't have a lot of options, this has got to come off one way or another. Not yet. Yeah, it's coming loose. With this side. There. There you have it, guys. Yeah. This is still a bit warm five minutes later, but probably if I'd taken this heat sink off, it would have been a bit easier to do actually, but never mind, it's done. So I've just cleaned it with a bit of ice, so you can see that's come off really nicely, no damage to any pads or tracks, and more importantly, no damage on this side. The switch has come off completely intact, but it is faulty. I don't think I'll even bother to try open it up and repair it. I think it handles quite a high voltage on this circuit, so he needs a switch. This is a two-pole six-way. 
Wall in UK, it says on it. So he also needs a switch for this. So basically, we know what we need now. We know how we're going to replace the bridge rectifier, how we're going to get around that problem. Everything else we can get. The relay will come off the same as that did, basically. That wouldn't be too difficult. I could try to open it up and clean the contacts, but to be quite honest, the replacement isn't expensive, and this is an expensive bit of kit, so let's do it properly. Everything else we've possibly can test we've tested so we know we just need the to replace this and this fit the relay in the switch and this should be as good to go as we can manage yeah and we see what happens with it after that hope you enjoyed that guys another look at industrial electronics repair i've done a bit of it now on the channel i will continue to do it without doubt this is one of the most profitable areas of electronics that you can get into if you want to make a living out of repairs you should be not looking at fixing laptops and phones you should be looking at fixing this sort of stuff this is where the money is most of these things are effectively irreplaceable so the owner which will always be a business will pay to have this fixed without a doubt okay this one I'm guessing 100 euros plus the cost of the parts would be a fair charge. That's on this island. I'm thinking probably in places with a higher cost of living, you can probably charge double that and still get the customer to say yes. Okay, so we've seen a few different skills there today a mixture of diagnosis, um, soldering techniques, intuition electronics knowledge and just a little bit of voodoo black magic yeah <laughs> and hopefully you guys are gaining these skills by watching this let me know how you feel about this sort of work now do you feel that you're ready for it do you feel this is the sort of thing you want to be doing yeah in the meantime i look forward to seeing your comments in the section below and i will just say i will see you all soon on another learning electronics repair video ciao for now guys